about Jerry Root. He's a professor of Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. He attended Whittier College in Whittier, California. Um, he he uh, has his uh, master's degree from Talbot Graduate School of Theology. He has his PhD through uh, Open University at the Oxford Center for Mission. Uh, he has studied C.S. Lewis for 50 years. He's taught Lewis for 40 years. He has uh, spoken on C.S. Lewis topics at 77 universities in 17 different countries. He has numerous books. We have all of them but one, and I was disappointed this morning to find out that we didn't have the one that's related to this lecture. <laughs> <laughs> so we will get that, Jerry, and we do have one we want you to sign before you leave today. But the, but the book's titles are The Quotable C.S. Lewis, The Soul of C.S. Lewis, C.S. Lewis and the Problem of Evil, the Surprising Imagination of C.S. Lewis. That's the one we haven't gotten yet. And we have a C.S. Lewis Bible and the Sacrament of Evangelism. So I may not have named them all, but, but all those are wonderful books. And you can see the focus on C.S. Lewis. He's been married to Claudia for 44 years. They have four married children, 15 grandchildren. And Jerry is known for a lot of things besides C.S. Lewis. He loves to do things like skydiving and spelunking and swimming and sh with sharks and uh, flying in vintage airplanes and doing hammerhead stalls and, air, and biplanes. And uh, the thing that he's most proud of, and I'm sure he reminds these guys, uh, is that he uh, was a running back for Whittier College in football, played football in some form or another until he was 44 years old, and then they kicked him out, right? Um, he was a running back, and he tells me, I don't know if I believe this, Jerry, that in a championship team where you were the starting running back for three years, you never once fumbled, and you never once lost even one yard. Wow. <laughs> okay, and we'll find out other lies um, <laughs> as we go along here. No, I believe him. I really do. I want to, I want to read to you a prayer, Okay. We always, uh, before our lecture, we always have a prayer. And this is just so perfect today, Jerry. You will appreciate this. This is a prayer that C.S. Lewis wrote in very faint pencil handwriting at the end of a nine-page speech. We have the handwritten nine-page speech the, uh, delivered by C.S. Lewis in 1939. It's in our collection at the far left end of the main hall. And at the very bottom... My theory is that C.S. Lewis wrote this doxology thinking nobody else will ever see it. But we get to see it. It's very hard to read, but I, I uh, deciphered it with great care. And I put it in bold uh, letters on the top of the display case, and here is what he wrote. It's our prayer right now. Now to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost be ascribed as is most justly due all honor might, majesty, dominion forever, henceforth, and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Jerry, we welcome you. Come and speak to us. Would you welcome him, please? I'm very grateful to be here with you this morning. Um, I did not have an academic background I grew up in South Central Los Angeles and so on. I wasn't a Christian when I went to college. And my uh, older brother was a Christian. He took me to a Campus Crusade for Christ meeting and I heard the gospel and I was very taken by the fact that God loved me unconditionally, forgave me. I knew I needed to be forgiven and that he would enter my life and begin the process of bringing order out of the chaos I had made of things. I had no academic interest except to stay eligible. I didn't know how to spell it, but it meant everything to me. <laughs> and um, I read through the Bible that first year. My mind started to wake up. I shared Christ with my football buddies, and they asked questions. I didn't know the answers to the questions, and I learned not to be threatened by questions. I dug for answers, and I saw a name crop up in the literature. C.S. Lewis, who's he? 
My older sister was teaching fifth grade and she was reading the Narnian Chronicles to her students and she told me about those books. I went out and read them. I said, this is fascinating. I wanted to find out about him. I read his autobiography, Surprised by Joy, and he talked about the deep longings of his heart and the quest to find the object of those longings. I knew the longings. He gave me a vocabulary for my soul. I read him voraciously. I read the books he referred to, and I found out lots of people talk about these longings because they're very common in each of us. I finished college and a friend of mine said wisely to me, you did not get an education in college. I thought, why did I pay all that tuition? He said, you did not get an education in college, you only laid a foundation for one. And commencement means you will now commence your education by building on that foundation. Pick an author who will take you places and make him your life study. I went on to seminary and decided I would pick C.S. Lewis as the author. And when I got to seminary, I had to write a thesis, and I knew I wasn't going to write it on the use of the optative mood in the book of Philemon in the Greek text. It wasn't going to hold me. But I wrote on Lewis, and so I started putting pen to paper about him. And since that time, I've been doing all this work on Lewis, and it's been a great ride, and you'll never get to the bottom of him. You read him, you read the books he refers to. I'm probably the only former PE major in the world who's actually read Spencer's Fairy Queen or Philip Sidney's In Praise of Posey. If my old football buddies saw me reading a book in Praise of Posey, they would have thought I lost my mind. But it was a liberal arts education to read him and read the people he takes you to. Lewis opens more than wardrobe doors. And so I found great fascination in him. And now I'm going to speak to you this evening, on C or this morning, on C.S. Lewis and the power of the imagination. But I want more than Lewis, and so I want to pray again, if you don't mind, Charles. Gracious Heavenly Father, I worship you for the privilege of being here now. I worship you for the fact that this moment never escaped your mind. You, being omnitemporal, always knew we would show up here this day. And so for this unique experience, I pray that you would meet each of us in a unique way. I think it's nonsense, Father, myself, to think that one person could speak in front of a room full of people, each with unique challenges on their hearts and minds, and think there would be any connection whatsoever. But I remember one time reading in the Word that your son took five loaves and two fish, not much, for the number of people that were hungry, and he broke them and multiplied them and blessed them, and everybody left satisfied. Would your Holy Spirit please do something like that with us today? Take the crumbs that are offered and let each person here hear something that would benefit him or her so that when they would leave, they would have a profound sense how uniquely and wonderfully loved they are by you that you gave them something unique and particular this morning. Let that happen among us. Fill us with your Spirit that it might and let your Spirit's ministry of glorifying Christ be our chief concern. In your name we pray, amen. My presentation about C.S. Lewis is like any presentation about C.S. Lewis. It should always be about so much more. Let me explain with a story. I've always had a love affair with words, even though I wasn't very literary when I was young. I remember the first time I fell in love with the word. It was in Mrs. Reinhardt's first grade class and she was going through vocabulary building by going through the flashcards. Do you remember that when you were in elementary school? The word I first fell in love with was the word swish. I still love that onomatopoeic word and my loyalties to that word occurred long before it was popularized by a clean shot in basketball. Pokey was another word like that. Um, another word, subtle perplexed, ambiguity. I love those words. Ostentatious. It's a word too ostentatious for my vocabulary, but nevertheless, I remember learning a particular word that I think will situate this lecture for us. As I mentioned, I grew up in South Central Los Angeles. We were poor. My mother always sent us to school with a lunch, a sandwich, a piece of fruit, and a couple cookies. But I would always watch the other kids go into cafeteria and I always wondered, what is that like to eat in the cafeteria at our school? It cost 31 cents. For us, that was prohibitive. One morning, to my complete surprise, my mother gave me the 31 cents, and I got to eat in the cafeteria that day. 
I was always worried I was going to lose the money, kept feeling down in my pocket to make sure it was there. And when I went into the cafeteria, with great relief, I gave the money to the woman behind the register. But I was nervous. In third grade, I couldn't have described it like this. But I would put it like this exactly. Being unfamiliar with the sociological protocols of elementary school cafeteria life, <laughs> would I do something stupid that would bring embarrassment to me? So I did exactly what the girl in front of me did. She gave the money to the cafeteria lady. I did the same. She grabbed that fiberglass tray. I did the same. She put her cutlery on it. I did the same. She put it on that chrome roll bar counter. Remember that thing? And she came to the first thing on the menu. What was it? String beans. I hate string beans. <clears throat> this cafeteria life wasn't quite cracked up to what I thought it would be. But apparently the girl didn't like string beans either. So she said to the cafeteria lady, do you remember her? She was kind of heavy set. She wore her hair and gray hair in a net, and she had a white outfit with a white apron with smudge marks all over it. She was the ubiquitous cafeteria lady who worked in every elementary school cafeteria in the world. <clears throat> and the girl said to her, I'll have a small portion of those, please. I'd never heard the word portion before. The woman grabbed a big spoon with holes in it so the juices could go through. She dug down deep into this pot, took a little bowl, and gave her three string beans. And I said to the lady, I'll have a small portion of those too, please. <laughs> she did the same thing for me, and I thought this word is interesting. But I never realized the magic of the word till I got to the end of the cafeteria line. Remember what was there? The desserts. <laughs> and I saw the most economically cut pieces of chocolate cake I'd ever seen in my life, and I thought, I wonder if this word has other applications. So I said to the cafeteria lady, I'll have a large portion of that, please. She cut me the biggest piece of chocolate cake I'd ever seen in my life, and I thought, that's a good word. <laughs> Psalm 73, beginning with verse 25, says, in a very wonderful way, whom have I in heaven but thee? And besides thee I desire nothing on earth. My heart and my flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. If you came here for a large portion of C.S. Lewis, I hope you leave disappointed. Lewis would want you to leave disappointed. But if you came here for a larger portion of Christ, and you want to get Christ mediated through Lewis to you, I hope you leave with your heart full. Because that's, I think, how any lecture about Lewis should go. Lewis said, when he focuses on any essay or lecture or book, the reader gets the idea that it is simply one thread in a much larger fabric. He wrote, I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun is risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. Lewis once wrote that most of his books were evangelistic. How would that be so? 77 books, mostly in literary criticism. His best books nobody reads. But he says they were evangelistic. How so? He wrote, we do not need more books about Christianity. We need more books on a host of topics by Christians with their Christianity laden. In a similar way, G.K. Chesterton wrote, I did, did not believe in Christianity because one or two things seemed to prove it. I believed in Christianity because everything seemed to indicate its proof. Bruce Edwards, one of the great C.S. Lewis scholars who passed away suddenly a few years ago, he wrote this, for Lewis, every critical posture is always an implicit ontology, a teleology, an eschatology. For in his implicit view of literacy, the critic is always defining the relationship of mankind, not only to texts, but also to ultimate matters, the ground of being, the locus of meaning, and the possibility of transcendence. For Lewis, the Christian, this means that literary inquiry is always, in some sense, apologetics, though, of course, rarely explicitly so. Lewis had a faith-integrated approach to the liberal arts. He told his students once in a lecture, also in the 1930s, when he wrote that prayer, we have fulfilled our whole duty to you if we can help you see some given tract of reality. He must have believed that students back then, even before social media, were also distracted. And he wanted to get their attention outside of themselves and see themselves situated in a wider world. He understood that truth is not reality. Truth is what I think about reality when I think accurately about it. 
The traditional understanding of truth is simply this. A statement is true when it says what is, is, or what is not, is not. And a statement is false when it says what is not, or a statement is false when it says what is not, is, or what is, is not. If I say this is a pen, that could be a true statement because there's a reality that supports the claim. If I say it's an elephant, elephants exist, this is not one, there's no reality that supports the claim. Anom anomalies have occurred throughout history to try and describe truth in relativistic ways, whatever, but they, they don't last. There's no reality to sustain their claims. Consequently, the claims tend to become self-referential and people like spiders begin to spin their sense of reality out from themselves like a spider spins its web. Um, years ago, I was in the restroom at the Billy Graham Center at Wheaton College. I was in the stall making a full deposit. <clears throat> and I heard somebody come into the restroom. I finished up and I came out and there's a woman fixing her makeup at the mirror. <laughs> she looked at me and started berating me as a man in the women's bathroom. Now, clearly we have a discrepancy in our conceptual frameworks. And she, as she argues with me, with one word, I solved the problem. I pointed and said, urinals. She went running out of the room, horrified. <laughs> there was no reality to support her claim. C.S. Lewis was in a debate at the Oxford Socratic Club. And there was a relativist who was speaking. And he said to Lewis, how do you know there isn't a blue, pian a blue cow on that piano right now? And Lewis just simply said, in what sense blue? If you have no reality to appeal to, you have no thing that will suggest the truth of your comment. This self-referential approach to reality can infect what passes itself off as Christian as well. C.S. Lewis said, the worst of bad men are religious bad men. The quicker I might be willing to die for my faith, maybe the quicker I'd be willing to kill for my faith. Or paint a thus saith the Lord across my own opinions, extending the doctrine of inerrancy to my interpretation, which is borderline blasphemy, I think. I don't think it is blasphemy because I don't think people realize they're doing it. But we could be in trouble. And, and I, I would have to say, in light of this, I was giving a lecture on C.S. Lewis and postmodern situation. I think more people talk about postmodernism than actually read about it. Like the student who once was asked, have you ever read War and Peace? And he said, no, but I wrote a book report on it once. So, so what, what, what happened was I was giving this lecture and there were probably two, 200 people there. It was a Christian crowd. This one woman jumped up to her feet in the middle of it. Imagine if it happened here and said, we don't need any of this. Just yelled it out. I don't remember the grad course I took on how to deal with a situation like that. So I had to improvise. I, I couldn't ignore her. I said, make your point. She said, we don't need any of this because we have the mind of Christ. I said, yeah, the Bible says that. Do you know where? She didn't. I said, it says it in 1 Corinthians 2.16. And when Paul wrote that, he was writing it to a broken church. There were people in chapter 1 where he says, they said, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Peter, I'm of Christ. Do you think when Paul wrote that, he was saying that we have the mind of Christ as an accomplished fact, as if we've achieved omniscience? Or do you think he said we have the mind of Christ as a valuable resource and with that resource the responsibility to try and dig as deep as we can and understand as best we might and apply as clearly as we can. Thomas Aquinas said an abuse doesn't nullify a proper use. We Christians could be abusive, any human could be abusive because we're fallen broken people as it's affirmed in scripture. And we are fallen broken people Christ came to redeem. If we judge any segment of society by its worst examples, nobody could stand. Nevertheless, Lewis observed, in coming to understand anything, we must reject the facts as they are for us in favor of the facts as they are. Reason is an asset to understanding, but so is the imagination. And Lewis wrote that in a letter, the imaginative man in me is older and more continuously operating than the rational man. And studying his writings, I've discovered over the years that he used 31 different ways to describe the imagination and its uses. You know, they say that people who are indigenous people who live up in the north, they have 30 different words for snow. 
because they live 24-7 in the cell. They see the nuances. Lewis was a man of the imagination. He saw the nuances there. And consequently, I'd say, too, not all are positive. Like all things human, even the imagination is subject to abuse. But Lewis was aware that we cannot grow and develop without some use of the imagination. Scientists know this. How does the scientific method begin? With a hypothesis. It's an imaginative endeavor to try and help me stretch beyond the confines of what I presently know. And when I test the hypothesis and discover things, how do I depict them? With models that are not the thing itself, but imaginative depictions of what I've discovered. The developmentalists know this is true also. All growth, they say, is preceded by a moment of disequilibrium. My present conceptual framework is no longer sufficient to explain the new data. Change is necessary. And we either change by accommodation, throwing out the old way of looking at things, or by assimilation, hanging on to the old way, but adding to it like a tree adds more rings. A healthy tree adds more rings. Um, I, I'll give you an example of this. I, I was teaching a C.S. Lewis class at Wheaton College, and I had a young woman in my class. Her name was Pharaoh Shannon. She was Irish, in case you didn't know. And she had her best friend coming to visit her, who was from Brown University, and their spring break was different than ours. And she said, we've been friends since kindergarten. My best friend is an atheist, and I want to bring her to class, and would you talk to her about spiritual things afterwards? I said, I'd be happy to. She brings her friend, and we meet, and I say, wow, you've been friends since kindergarten. Tell me about that friendship. Not all of us have friendships that extend that many years in our lives. And they talked about that, and I said, she says, you're from Brown University. You must be very bright, Ivy League school. Tell me about that. What are you studying? She says, uh, biochemistry. We talked a little further, and I said, well, we talked about spiritual things in this class. What did you think? She said, well, as a biochemist, which I thought was a little premature, she was only a sophomore. <laughs> she said, as a biochemist, I live by the principle, if I can't perceive it empirically, I just don't believe it. I said, that's the principle you live by. If you can't perceive something empirically, you won't believe it. She says, yes. I said, would you please set that principle forth for me empirically? <laughs> I hope you see the problem. It's an inherent contradiction. It's a proposition that is not empirically perceived. It's grasped with the mind. She saw the contradiction. She was a bright brown student, and she freaked out. <laughs> she said, I've never seen the contradiction in my own presupposition. She said, why, everybody at Brown University believes this. I said, no, there's Christians there too. <laughs> and I said, and you know what? Just to be fair to materialists, I've met materialists who would never subscribe to that. So let's be fair. But I said, this is the thing. Um, John Polkinghorn, who taught at uh, Cambridge University and was, had a degree in theology and a degree in physics. He taught physics. He was the president of one of the Cambridge University colleges. He said, if you ask the scientists, why is the kettle boiling? The scientists would tell you, based on the measurable features and observable features, that heat from the burners agitating the molecules and it's burning at a, I mean, it's, it's a, a, at 100 degrees centigrade sea level, it boils. He says, that's a good answer. That's the answer the scientists would give you. He said, but you could also say, I would like a cup of tea, and would you like one too? And the second answer, you couldn't arrive at by mere scientific method. And so this becomes very, very important. And I said to her too, Mortimer Adler, the philosopher, who was at the University of Chicago, said, in three generations, we've gone from saying that which is measurable is that which is important for science to saying that which is measurable is the only thing that's important. And I said to this young woman, don't get me wrong, I love the sciences, and I love what the engineers have done in applying what the scientists have discovered. Our lives are better because of that. But I said, but the sciences are only one quarter of the discussion in the liberal arts tradition. And I want to hear the whole gamut I want to hear what the social scientists tell us as they discover through demographics what the culture is thinking and how it's moving. Culture is always fluid and there's always room to learn more. I want to learn what the fine arts have to say as they emphasize what Tolkien said, we're made in the image of a creator and we want to do creative things with our music, our poetry, our literature, our theater. And I want to hear what the liberal arts have to say, the humanities. 
I want to see what the philosophers and historians and literary people say as we read through thousands of years of literature and we find there are some things that flare up like fireworks on 4th of July and die out and that's the last you hear of it and there are other things that percolate in our philosophy our history and literature that keeps coming to the surface generation after generation and they speak to us about the deep things of the heart and I want to know about those because I want to understand myself and I want to understand the people I live with and I want to understand that if there's some sort of commonality in all this maybe it indicates there's somebody behind all of this and that was Lewis's of course, belief, his strong belief. So consequently, we begin to realize even theolo theologians know that we cannot grow in our thinking about God without some use of the imagination. The word definition literally means of the finite, of that which has ends. I can define the pen because I can wrap words around it. It's small enough. Or the pulpit. Or the chapel. But how do you define God? How do you define that which is infinite? He breaks the category. Even when Jesus is going to talk about the kingdom of heaven, he says the kingdom of heaven is like. He uses simile, metaphor, figures of speech, parables. And, and consequently, we can start to gain a heart understanding and get our heads around it in a limited sort of way. Walter Elwell, the theologian, said all theology is approximation. And we continually seek better and better approximations. Lewis, after writing Out of the Silent Planet, his first science fiction book, he said, I've discovered that any amount of theology can now be smuggled into people's minds under the guise of romance. There's some things we're not going to get any other way. And consequently, then, let's look at a selection of Lewis's uses of the imagination. We're not going to look at all 31, but I just want to pick a few. And I want to pick some negative ones, and I want to pick mostly positive ones. Negative uses of the imagination. I don't know about you, but when I was a kid and we had to eat dinner, I always wanted to eat my vegetables first. Let's get the vegetables out of the way. We'll look at the negative uses of the imagination first. There's what he calls the generous imagination. And that's the tendency to inflate reality, uh, to overstate you always, you never. These kinds of statements then keep us from clarities because we project on somebody something that might not be so. Richard Weaver, who wrote Ideas Have Consequences, also wrote a sequel to that book, The Ethics of Rhetoric. And he says, we live in a culture where we have devil terms and God terms. The devil terms we reserve for those we don't like, and the God terms we reserve for those we do like. And we overstate and inflate. And, and Lewis talks about the idea that the authors that he was attracted to before he was a Christian were Christian authors because they wrote of the roughness and density of life. They wrote of things as they really were rather than how people maybe had to have them be. So beyond the generous imagination that inflates, he writes about the negative use of the imagination as the transforming imagination. He gets this example from William Wordsworth. It's what psychologists would call projection. I'm transforming, I'm projecting on things in the hopes that they'll become what I want them to be. Some of this grows out of a, a philosophical concept called akrasia or akrasia. It's a word you get from Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics where he talks about um, um, the rationalizing of bad behavior. And if I do something bad, I'll rationalize that bad behavior to the point of blindness, moral blindness, if I don't repent of it. Lewis wrote this, continued disobedience to conscience makes conscience blind. Or Paul wrote in Romans 1.18, we suppress the truth in our unrighteousness. If I, I think I could depict this. George MacDonald, an author who deeply influenced C.S. Lewis, in his book, Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood, said, we do not have souls. We are souls. We have bodies. You tell a child he has a soul, he thinks like anything else he has, his keys, his lunch, his coat. He could leave it behind and he goes someplace else. He thinks when he dies, um, he goes into the grave and his soul goes someplace else. Lewis says, no, tell the child he is a soul and he has a body. And when he dies, he goes to heaven and he leaves his body behind like clipped hair, for those of you that still go to barbers, clipped hair behind at a barber shop. Oh, I don't know exactly what makes up the soul. I've read lots of books on this. But traditionally, we've said the soul, that immaterial part of what it means to be human, has a choosing part, 
volition, has a thinking part, reason, has a feeling part, the emotion. I want to suggest to you, even coming from an academic environment, hands down, the reason is the weakest part. If I make a bad choice, my reason doesn't kick in and say, boy, Jerry, that was really stupid. You follow down that line, you're just going to hurt yourself and you're going to hurt the people who care for you. No, my reason being weak starts to make all kinds of excuses for that bad choice, rationalizing it, even putting me in opposition of other people who would speak to me the truth when I don't want to hear the truth. If I'm hurt emotionally, my reason doesn't kick in and say, boy, Jerry, you need to grieve that. Process that, grieve that, and forgive the person that hurt you, lest you become bitter and toxic. Anne Lamont in her book, uh, um, um, my wife says my mind's like lightning when flashed in total darkness. Um, anyway, in one of her books, she says, bitterness is like you drinking the rat poison and then waiting for the rat to die. I want my reason to kick in and help me get over those obstacles, not marinate in them. And so consequently, Lewis says reason, being weak, forms dragon sentries before my heart, preventing what will get to my heart and my mind. He said, how do you get past all the excuses and the dragon sentries? And he says, I think so sometimes story gets past the watchful dragons the use of the imagination. And, and, and we, we all, all of us who are Christians, who read the Bible, we're aware of this. Remember when David sinned so egregiously and Nathan gets the responsibility to go tell him. And how does Nathan do it? He tells him a story. Jesus lives among a bunch of people who he says have eyes to see but don't see. They have ears to hear but don't hear. What does he do? He tells them parables. He allows them to see. So those are the negative. There's more, but those two particularly. Generous imagination, transforming imagination. Positive uses of the imagination. Uh, one is called the shared imagination. The shared imagination. This is a rhetorical use of the imagination. It seeks to connect with the audience by drawing on common or shared experiences and building on these. If you've read Lewis, that's exactly how he begins Mere Christianity. Have you ever noticed when people argue? And he's drawing us into his narrative at that point. Um, Lewis talks about different kinds of metaphors, for example. He talks about the pupil's metaphor. That's when we're, we don't understand something and we craft a metaphor to help us move into the realm of understanding. Then he talks about the master's metaphor. You're teaching the junior high group at your church. You understand a theological concept. And so consequently, you craft a metaphor as a teacher that brings them into the realm of knowledge. He also talks about a thing called transposition. And transposition is when we recognize anything that's transcendent, that's going to exhibit itself in our place and time, will always need more robust understanding because this is complex, way more complex than we've grasped. So here's an example. When Lewis reasoned his way through the morass of atheism and its supporting materialism, when he reasoned his way through agnosticism, and when he came to the place where he would say he was a theist, he said, I didn't think I could know God personally any more than Hamlet could know Shakespeare. His dear friend, J.R.R. Tolkien, went on a walk with him on Addison's Walk in Magdalen College, Oxford. It was a late night talk, and here is Tolkien. Tolkien and Lewis were in a club together where they used to read Icelandic sagas and the original Icelandic. And Tolkien said, you love the story of God coming down in the myths and so on. How come you reject it in the one place where it reports to be real? There's the shared imagination. Here's a shared experience. He's trying to communicate the gospel to him. Two weeks later, C.S. Lewis became a Christian. He revisited the Hamlet Shakespeare image, and he said it dawned on me after the talk with Tolkien that if Hamlet could ever get to know Shakespeare, the author, Hamlet could never break out of the play to get to know the author. But Shakespeare, the author, could have written himself into the play as a character and made the introduction possible. And he says, I think that's what happened in the incarnation. So there's the pupil's metaphor, Lewis championing the Hamlet Shakespeare analogy. 
There's the master's metaphor, him revisiting it and seeing how it works, but we're not done. We're all gonna go on a field trip. We're gonna go in a time machine to Elsinore in Denmark. We're gonna put on clothes of the period and we're gonna walk around the courtyard and we're gonna realize things are kind of sketchy around here. Kings died in the height of his strength and rather than the crown going to the crown prince Hamlet, it goes to the king's brother Hamlet's uncle. There's some sketchy things going on. Hamlet's been acting kind of strange. Some people say, though, there's a method to his madness. And Ophelia's a basket case. And all of a sudden, we see this little man in Elizabethan tights with a little goatee, frizzy hair, and an earring. And we say to him, who are you, and how did you get past the guards? And he says, well, my name's Shakespeare. And you live in a world that I created for you. And I just wanted to tell you, I know things have been sketchy, but eventually it's going to all work out. And what do we say to that little man? Yeah, sure. <laughs> and that means there's always going to be room for more imaginative thinking along these lines. Lewis's concept of transposition is about that. Um, I think that there's always more to do, and we're always trying to get around this glorious story of the Incarnation and the Atonement. But the shared imagination allows us to learn from the images that are in our own culture already, because people are fascinated by this story. When my children were little, we were watching a Disney movie, The Jungle Book. And you remember how Mowgli gets lost from his parents and he's raised by Baloo and Bagheera the panther, Baloo the bear. Shere Khan the tiger wants to kill the man-child. There comes the moment of showdown and Baloo puts himself in harm's way and saves the boy and the tiger goes off and it looks like Baloo the bear is dead. And Bagheera the panther goes walking off with Mowgli, looking over at the limp body of their friend and says, Greater love hath no man than this, that he would lay down his life for a friend. I go, that just doesn't sound like Kipling to me. <laughs> I went and looked through my jungle book. I couldn't find it anywhere. It's in John 15. How did it get in that Disney movie? Years later, I was asked to come and speak to the Disney artists. They have all 350 of them come in once a, week, a month give them a box lunch, and they bring in somebody to lecture on some idea of story, and they want to know Lewis and Tolkien's vision of story. They told me, we know these authors are Christian. If you have to mention it because of their authors, that's okay, but this isn't a place to proselytize. I didn't need to proselytize. If I get them interested in the authors, they'll go read for themselves and find Christ, maybe. But they said you can answer any questions in the Q&A time, any questions our, our artists ask. So I give the lecture as soon as I'm done. First hand, weren't Lewis and Tolkien Christians? Could you tell us about that? <laughs> Next question, isn't Aslan a Christ figure in the Narnian books? Can you tell us about that? Next question, are there any Christ figures in Tolkien? Because like, you know, Gandalf the Grey dies saving the fellowship from the Balrog and then he comes back as Gandalf the White. Is that a, a thing like Jesus in the resurrection? Every question in the question time was like that. Meeting's over, artists go back to work, 20 artists come up to talk with me. And I say, I, I, I don't get it. Um, you look like the artists that were all asking me questions. They said, you're a Christian, aren't you? I said, yeah, are you? They said, yeah, why do you think we were asking you the questions? <laughs> I said, well, I have a question for you. How did greater love hath no man than this that he lay down his life for a friend? Get in the jungle book. And they said, oh, we've been smuggling things in all along. <laughs> They also said other people have been smuggling other things all along, too. But nevertheless, the thing is, this story, we're so fascinated by it. Um, James Cameron, every time I've heard him talk, he says something bad about Christians. I don't know what the burr is under his saddle, but what are the movies he makes? Terminator 2, an alien from another world, comes into our world and gives up his life to save the woman and her child. The next movie he makes is a Titanic, spent more money than had ever been spent on a movie in history. And he's got to make it work. He's got investors involved in everything. He builds a set a quarter the size of the original Titanic. He's got Celine Dion doing the music at the height of her, her, her uh, 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 powers. And he's got Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet, these great box office draws. He's got to tell a story. What story does he tell? The one that always works. The shared imagination. And so Jack wins a ticket 
to the doomed ship and goes immediately to the bow of the ship and makes the shape of the cross and says, I'm king of the world. There's a woman stuck on that ship and she's stuck in in a a relationship that's been arranged by her mother because her father died and he's left them penniless and she says, I'm not going to be a washerwoman. So she pushes her daughter to marry a guy who's who's basically the incarnation of Satan himself on this doomed ship and her whole life is doomed and she goes to the stern of the ship to throw herself in the water and who happens to be there? Jack saves her life. They bring the old lady now back after they've discovered the Titanic. They tell us the story of that night. She tells the story about how she was ready to die and how he saved her and then he disappeared as mysteriously as he came onto the ship and they said we have no record of him on the on the register she says isn't that amazing but he saved me in every way does that at all sound familiar to you what's the next movie he makes avatar a man takes on the flesh of the people of that world goes into that world and saves that world you know what avatar means in sanskrit incarnation and all these images are in our culture um, it could be reading Les Miserables, it could be reading uh, um, Moby Dick, it could be reading War and Peace, it could be reading uh, Brothers Karamazov. It's there, and we can appeal to this, and Lewis would appeal to the shared imagination. There's also what he called the medieval imagination, which was the realizing imagination. This is the bud that comes to full flower and opens up to a wider world, breaks us out of our self-referentialism, and helps us to see better. It plays on embellishments. It builds on stories that build on other stories. We do it in our own culture. What's West Side Story a retelling of? Romeo and Juliet. How about August Rush? It's Oliver Twist retold. Uh, the Robin Williams guy is the uh, Fagan character there. Oh, brother, where art thou? The Odyssey. The Lion King. Hamlet. Bridget Jones' Diary. Pride and Prejudice. Clueless. Emma. Inception. The myth of Orpheus and Eurydice. We are always playing on issues of the imagination, moving from one to more, the medieval um, realizing imagination. You you, you have it in the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, where Lewis uses this particularly. In the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, who's the most spiritually sensitive person from our world to ever go into Narnia? Hands down, it's Lucy. And she's there. She loves Aslan. They come to this one island, it's called the Island of the Voices. These are duffel puds. They're really monopods, but they can't even remember their own identity, and they're basically parodies on what it is for us to be human. And they've been turned invisible because of their disobedience. And so they are told that they can't be made visible unless a girl, it has to be a girl, goes up into the magician's library in this grand house and reads a spell from the magician's book that would make them visible. Lucy's courageous, she volunteers, she'll go. And she goes up there and she knows it's a big book, but they don't know where in the book is the spell to make them visible and she's gonna have to start from the very beginning. She goes up into the library, she's got her back to the door, she's up on a pedestal and she can't open the book. She realizes it's it's class, she opens it, it's a big book and it had a nice smell. And when she touched it, it was tingly to her fingers and it was written calligraphy with thick downstrokes, thin upstrokes. And there was a margin that was illuminated and she began to see it was not only illuminated, it was, it was um, also like a cartoon, it was animated. And she reads in this book and as she reads in the book, she, she reads a spell for how to give a person a donkey's head like they did to poor bottom in Midsummer Night's Dream how to make it rain after a drought, how to make it stop raining after a long rain, how to take away a wart with a silver bowl and a golden thread and a bowl of water on a full moon night. And she finally gets to this one spell, how to make one more beautiful than the lot of mortals. And she was always the less comely of the two sisters, Susan and Lucy. And while she's looking at this spell, she sees in the margin a girl like herself standing in a podium looking in a book, and she sees a girl like Susan standing over here with everybody paying attention to her. She sees the girl read the spell, and then she sees everybody stop looking at Susan and look at her and come to her and give all their attention to her, and all of a sudden people start fighting for her favors, and armies are deployed, and ships are launched, and wars are fought, 
It's just like Helen of Troy, and she starts to say this particular spell, and the lion's face comes up out of the book, and quickly she turns a page. The next spell, how to listen in on what people are saying about you when you're not there. You know how it is where you've maybe resisted some great temptation, and really, if you were honest, you realize you were just saved by other people? It wasn't your cleverness. And now the small thing comes, and so you just rush right into it, because you deserve that one. So she feels she deserves it, and she says this spell, and she begins to hear her friends talking about her when she's not there, and it just breaks her heart. And she's so sad. She moves on to the next spell for the refreshment of the Spirit. For the refreshment of the Spirit. And it goes on for three pages. And after the three pages... She wants to go back and read it again because it was so wonderful, but all the words start to disappear. And when she goes to go back, she says, what was that story about? Oh yeah, it was about a cup and a sword and a green hill and a tree. And from that day on, whatever she considered a good story was a story that reminded her of the one that her imagination was awakened to in this particular story. The next page is how to make things visible again after they've been invisible. And she speaks it, and Aslan the lion, the Christ figure, is standing right next to her. She says, Aslan, when did you get here? He says, I've been here all along, dear heart. Did you not think I would abide by my own rules? But you've been listening in where you shouldn't have listened in. Oh, Aslan, will it ever get better? He says, nobody ever gets to hear what it might have been like, but everybody can find out what it will be like. Now come with me. We must meet the owner of this house. And when she goes out, she says, Aslam, will you ever tell me the other story? Will you tell it to me again? And she says, dear heart, that's a story I will tell to you over and over and over and over again. What was the story? It was the gospel story. The cup that Jesus drank, the sword, the death that he died, the hill, Calvary, the tree, the cross. And the realizing imagination as we encounter that story afresh with new raiment in the voyage of the dawn treader and we leave there saying, wow, more precious than ever. More precious than ever. And lastly is the penetrating imagination. Lewis writes an essay, Variation in Shakespeare. He says when Shakespeare writes a sonnet, in one sonnet he may use seven different metaphors. He's getting all around this thing and going deeper with it. He writes an essay called Dante's Similes. Dante will use many similes to describe one thing. It tells us that we don't get usually to the bottom of things. It's the nature of truth. You do not get a last word about anything. I can say this is a pen, that's true, but it has a length, it has a width, it has a molecular structure, it has a history, it comes from the iron stylus, it moves to the feather quill pen. We can talk about gel pens, this is a gel pen. We can talk about ballpoints, fountain pens. Um, and, and, and we can talk about its function, how it writes on paper, how it writes on cardboard, how it writes on paper smeared with butter, not very well. This is just a pen and we won't get to the bottom of it. You don't get a last word about anything. Oh, we can have a last court of appeal. We appeal to the scriptures as a final court of appeal, but I'm not talking about it that way. I'm talking about you never get to the depth of anything because the world is fascinating and complex. Consequently, we can be frustrated by that, but don't hear me say if you can't have a last word, it doesn't mean you can't have a sure word. You can have a sure word. This is a pen. You can have a sure word, so have confidence with what you know. But hold what you know in an open hand because you don't know it infinitely, so consequently, hold it with humility. You can always go deeper with every truth. You can always go wider with every application, and so on. And the imagination can lead you in those directions. At the end of the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, we come back to Lucy again. She's she's already witnessed her older brother, Peter, and her older sister, Susan, at the end of Prince Caspian, being told they won't be coming back to Narnia. They've gotten older and they need to grow closer to their world now. And Lucy anticipates this might happen to her. And at the end of the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, she's told, you're not coming back to Narnia. And she weeps. She weeps. She says, oh, Aslan, it's not Narnia, you know. It's you. 
How can we go on living knowing we'll never encounter you again? He says, oh, dear heart, I live in your world too. Only there I go by another name. And you have been brought here for a time that knowing me here, you might know me better there. There's a good use of the imagination, the penetrating imagination that in literature allows us to go deeper and understand better and encounter Christ more frequently. I tell my students, if you've gotten a faith-integrated liberal arts education, any topic you come up with has a natural segue to the gospel, has a natural segue to the place of worship. So, in conclusion, the imagination allows us to express our doubts. If you don't have any doubts about your faith, you're delusional because you think you've achieved omniscience. Don't be afraid of doubts. Jesus never called Thomas Doubting Thomas. We projected that on him. Jesus gave him good answers. Your imagination allows you to explore those. It allows you to ask questions. It allows you to seek for answers. It allows you to make discoveries and express a heart full of wonder and awe and ultimately worship, worship. Let's pray. Father, let each person hear something that connects with the place where they're at and the challenges of their own heart, their joys, their struggles, whatever, and let each in the long run gain a larger portion of you, in whose name we pray, amen. I can failed I, to mention can, earlier that uh, we ask, have three by five cards, either under your chairs or on the back of the pew in front of you and near the aisle. So would you please quickly take a card if you'd like to ask Jerry a question and get those uh, to the aisle or wave them at us and we'll come get them. David Capes will help me here to find these. Can I make one quick observation? Yeah. You, you were generous with your applause. I'm grateful. But if you got something out of this, Remember this, God loves you, and he gave you something. I offered crumbs, and the scriptures say, Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. If the segue occurred, God loves you, and he gave you what you needed today. Worship him. Amen. 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 So, anybody have a question? Just there's write a, it on a, the card, please. We got one, one back here. Thank you. Okay. Wow, this is a long one. Um, I'll just read it and make sure, or, or, or try to read it. Um, could you please speak to Lewis's use of allegory in the Narnia series, particularly in Prince Caspian, the employment of Bacchus in the service of Aslan, and the liberating cry of, wow, can't make it out, uh, but I'll give you this card, um, see if you can read it. The liberating cry, yeah, uh, is that the donkey's cry? Oh, Bacchus, about the wine, about the wine, right, and also in the silver chair, the thorn in Oslan's country after the death of Caspian used to pierce the paws of Aslan to rescue the dead, Caspian who lies at the bottom of the stream. Well, I think, I, first off, Lewis never wrote an allegory except one, um, the Pilgrim's Regress, an allegorical apology for Christianity, reason, and romance. First book he wrote after he was a Christian, he wrote it one year after he was a Christian, and he wrote it in three weeks. It's amazing. But he said the Narnian books are not allegories, they're supposals. An allegory is like an extended metaphor every point in the story has to represent something in our world. And he said it was used to depict so that we could see something in our world with greater clarity, not to hide, but to reveal. And the Narnian books, he says, are supposals, and they allow us to suppose Christ came to a world like Narnia, and then we go from there. 
Now, when he uses Bacchus, Lewis, uh, Tolkien did not like the Narnian books. Now, remember, Tolkien and Lewis had had the conversation about the myths coming down and all that sort of thing. And Lewis and Tolkien are very different than Joseph Campbell or, or, or some of these uh, people who are doing works where the myths are the, the uh, uh, collective subconscious coming up into the stories. No, Lewis and Tolkien both had this idea that the stories come down. And Lewis came to believe that the myths were to the pagan world like the Old Testament was to the Jewish world. That God was scattering stories everywhere. So Tolkien, who was a perfectionist, didn't like Lewis using all kinds of myths in his stories, bringing them all together, like you said, Bacchus or Santa Claus or any of these things. And Lewis thought, no, all the myths, all the myths are helpful because they let, us to see, they let us see imaginative depiction and lift us hopefully from the story up to the grand story. So that's why he's doing that. Um, the one about the paw, the blood, it's just the blood brings life. I think that it's probably something like that. I don't want to press the point too much because again, I don't think it's an allegory, but I think it's an interesting depiction. Is that fair? Does that help? Here's a quick one. You'll want to go a long time, but you can't, okay? Uh, our Sunday school class is studying mere Christianity. What points are the most important? <laughs> <laughs> Two. Well, Two. I, I could Maybe go three. on and on. Well, he, use, he uses. Well, I sh- could too. Any of us. He, could. he uses a shared imagination. He begins with a common experience and then builds a whole understanding of theology. That means he's opened up a wide door for anybody to come in at that point. Second thing is that he points to Christ. There's the large portion again. The whole thing builds up to this one who claimed to be God. And then he starts talking after that about what it is to mature in Christ. Mere Christianity, Frank. That's the one I gave you. Okay. Uh, Does C.S. Lewis speak to an imagination that is captured by evil? As captured by evil? Yeah, anything that's human can go wrong. But the the evil, Lewis understands that evil is, is a perversion of the good. So the evil compares to good more like bread mold compares to bread. So humans can do things with bread mold. What do we do? We make penicillin from it. So Lewis says, will you not at least allow God the capacity to make something good out of the evil that's occurred? And consequently, we would say he makes a greater good out of what's happened. He wouldn't have allowed it to happen had he not known that he would bring greater good out of its occurring than not occurring. And so I think that that's it. It's a, evil's a perversion of good. God's at work. Have hope. Good. What is your one favorite C.S. Lewis written work? Whichever one I'm reading at that moment. <laughs> I've read them all over and over and over again. And I, I just finished another book. Went to the publisher this last week, and I got another one going at the end of the month. And, and it's called The Neglected C.S. Lewis. I did it with Mark Neal, the same one I did the Imagination book with. And we're looking at it, all the best books Lewis writes that nobody reads. There's literary critical work. And, and so we did this, and, and I just was trafficking in these books. English literature in the 16th century, excluding drama. 700-page book. He read every book written in English that century to write that book. He read every book translated into English in the original language, Italian, French, Latin. In order and in English, so that he can make a judgment of the translation. It's a fabulous book, and, and, and so on. But people don't read this. Okay, so we're writing a book on the neglected C.S. Lewis. If they neglect those books, they're certainly going to neglect ours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Okay, here's one. We need a quote Lewis for today. Do you see anyone coming up? A Lewis for today? No, uh-huh. I don't. And I would hope that there would never be somebody who would compromise the unique way God made them to be Lewis of the past and miss out on being the person God took delight in making them. Okay. I'll add a question, a uh, personal question to that one. In the last few days, uh, David Capes, and I want to introduce David. Uh, David, come over here by me. David Capes is just recently added as a senior research fellow or scholar to the Lanier Theological Library. You can applaud. Uh, David. I, I meant to introduce you earlier, David, but uh, we are really, really grateful and thrilled to have him here. Uh, David has recently been dean at Wheaton College, and before that, a professor at uh, HBU and uh, Houston Graduate School of Theology. We are literally thrilled to have David here. He's been a longtime friend of this library. Um, He was my boss. David and I were meeting. He was my boss, many emanations above me at Wheaton. 
Okay, that's right. I forgot about that. <laughs> David and I were meeting this week with uh, a lady who is an outstanding scholar in Islam and also Christianity. And she's a strong Christian. And, and her question was, why did C.S. Lewis get so much attention and continues to thrill people like us when John Stott and others didn't? Well, I think John Stott's brilliant. He had yep. a pastor's heart, and he spoke well propositionally, and he was very informed. But he did not employ the imagination as robustly as Lewis did. Yeah. And, and Stott, too, was a wonderful person. I met him and had opportunity to, to meet him a few different times, meals with him and stuff. And the one thing, he, 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 he was a serious guy. He didn't have near the humor that Lewis had. And I think sometimes humor opens yes. doors and access. So not to, not to in any way um, look down on Stotts. Yeah. He's one of my absolute heroes. Yeah. But I think Lewis has a wider play because there's more connecting points. Totally agree. Totally agree. Here's another one. Lewis talks in his essay on writing for children about not adding a moral to your story if it does not come naturally. Could you touch on this? Yeah, if it comes naturally, let it go. You, the, the story, if, if you write a good story, there will be tension. And there will be, hopefully, some sort of human conflict. And out of that conflict, hopefully, there will be some sort of resolution. Maybe the resolution will be the way you attempted to solve it, failed. And so, therefore, don't go that way again. But usually, a good story will come to some conclusion like this. And it's interesting, I, was, I take students out to share Christ. We were at the Ogilvy Transportation Center in Chicago, took the train in, and I met this man. It was around, it was around uh, uh, in September, two years ago. And, and I said, I'm a professor at Wheaton College. I'm here with some students. We're sharing Jesus with people. Um, would you mind if we talk with you? He says, I'm Jewish. I said, that's how Jesus started out. <laughs> and, and he started laughing, so that, that meant, okay, if we can be funny, we can have some connection. I said, what's your name? He said, Daniel. I said, wow, that's a great name. You know what it means? He says, no. I said, it means God is my judge. And he says, listen, you're not going to get through to me. You're not going to change me. I'm Orthodox, and besides, this is our high holy day. I said, which one is it? He says, Yom Kippur. I said, oh, yeah, I'll change you because you've already changed. He said, what do you mean? I said, if this is your high holy day, Friday night, and it's Yom Kippur, and you're not in temple, then you have changed quite a bit. <laughs> and he said, you got me. So he started talking. I said, tell me a little bit about yourself. He was a playwright. I said, I want to know about your plays. What makes for a good play? And he talked about the issue of human struggle and human conflict. And when we started talking about that, we started then segueing easily to the gospel of the God who loves us, who forgives us, and who brings order out of the chaos of his life. 20 minutes we talked. He said, I got to go catch my train. I said, what's your middle name? He said, Joshua. I, <laughs> I said, that means Jehovah is salvation. Your name is the gospel. Daniel, God is my judge, but Jesus is my salvation. And he left. <laughs> Isn't that fun? It's so much fun. That's great. Amen. Okay. Time for a couple more, real quick. Uh, some Christians emphasize utility over creativity, especially over the creation of art, favoring instead addressing basic needs such as food, shelter, and so forth. What would you or Lewis say to that? Well, first off, I'd ask them to define their terms, because mm -hmm. I'm not convinced that utility is necessarily uncreative. It can be very creative. But if they're making it an either or, then we've got some other problems. But when, when you build a building, because you need a house, Mortimer Adler, so this is a defining characteristic of what it is to be human. Animals build things. Beavers build dams, bees build hives, birds build nests, uh, just like we build houses and so on. But you never see a Romanesque period of beaver dam. <laughs> you never see a Gothic period of, of uh, bees nests or bees hives or something like this, or a prairie architecture period of robin nest. So we do gauge in utility, and it is creative, and we decorate what we do. Why? Because we love beauty. What does that tell us about us? It's fabulous. So I don't think you have to see a conflict, but if you prefer one over the other and you suppress the other side, I think you're selling yourself short. Okay, here's one. Did Lewis ever write on how becoming a parent to Joy's boys affected his spiritual understanding? Um, 
Not that I'm aware, in some of the letters, you'll find some brief references to that. Doug Gresham, his son, is a very close friend, and he stays with us when he's in Chicago, and I'll be with him a couple times in the next uh, few, few months. And, and it's interesting to hear him talk about Lewis and growing up in that home. He said, Lewis was not a flawless, a, 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 an unflawed man, but he said, I never saw anybody practice his faith more consistently and also be so quick to ask for forgiveness if he thought he did something wrong. That shows security in the love of Christ, doesn't it? So. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I want to get this one in, even though it's a little longer. Uh, the screw tape letters has always intimidated me to the point that I am afraid to read it because of spiritual, because spiritual warfare is real. What would you say to someone like me? Perfect love casts out fear. Lather up in the love of Christ and don't be afraid of Satan. I've been involved in eight exorcisms. The demons screech and scream at the name of Jesus. They traffic in fear. They want us to be afraid. But they are puffer fish. And you challenge them. The scriptures say, resist the devil. He'll flee from you. Flee temptation. We usually incline towards temptation and we get afraid of Satan. And it should be just the opposite. Great answer. Great answer. Okay, uh, finally, and I'm not hitting them all, but uh, here, I'll, I'll finish with this one. Can you please, this is please, can you please Keep reiterate the impact that C.S. Lewis had on you personally? Um, he helped me clarify the reality of Christ in my life. He helped me understand better the love of Christ for me, his forgiveness his willingness to be Lord of my life with all of my shortcomings and how he is faithful to me. And then he also, like I said, opens more than wardrobe doors. Reading him became for me a liberal arts education. I went from being a PE major to a lover of the Greek playwrights, to a lover of Homer, to a lover of Plato, to a lover of Aristotle, to a lover of Athanasius, to a lover of Augustine, to a lover of Dante, to a lover of Milton and Chaucer and Shakespeare and Milton and the metaphysical poets John Donne and George Herbert, to a lover of Chesterton, Tolkien, Owen Barfield, to a lover of Charles Williams, and on and on it goes. And my life is better because of it. Amen. And our lives are better because you were here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.